Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized tonight's event. This is one of almost a thousand programs we've done since the pandemic uh, began in order to bring you our usual uh, offerings to help you think about all kinds of different issues um, from before the pandemic, but now we bring it to you live stream as well as in person. So tonight we have Ed Larson coming back. He's been at the Commonwealth Club so many times over the years for each of the great books that he's written. He has another great book out uh, today about our uh, American inheritance, about slavery and liberty. Ed Larson, thanks for coming back to the Commonwealth Club again, this time without too much travel. <laughs> Thank you for having me. The only thing I regret is not being with you in person and your amazing uh, audience. Well, our audience gets really big online, so uh, we hope that you all enjoy this because this is really a fantastic new book by Ed um, as uh, Ed and I were saying before, uh, just before the program, his uh, book Summer for the Gods uh, was the first one to take a look at the Scopes trial, the Snopes trial, sorry, uh, about uh, in, in Kentucky. Kentucky? Did I have that right, right? Tennessee. Tennessee. Tennessee oh, close enough. Yeah, no, not but close From enough. here, they all blur together. <laughs> and, uh, you know, about uh, the trial over whether evolution could be taught in schools, et cetera, uh, back in the 20s or 30s? Was it the 20s? 1925. 1925. We're having uh, two years, the 100th anniversary, and everyone can come to Dayton, Tennessee, and see me there. <laughs> <laughs> Make your plans now. Um, so, <laughs> so, as he said, um, that's the first history of that trial that was written. People, It's a very important trial. People have talked all about it. And now we have another topic, uh, uh, the start of slavery. How, how did America start with respect to slavery? There's a large number of people who use this idea. And some people say that slavery was endemic to the revolution. Other people say it had nothing to do with it. It tried to stop slavery. Um, but as usual in the polemics, uh, neither party is 100% right. So Ed st stood back, got all of the facts down, wrote it out. Excellently, I really encourage anybody interested in that topic to read this book because it's it's really it's really a different approach the way historians are supposed to do these things. Um, and uh, Ed has another great book, um, which I think is going to win some awards. So, Ed, why don't you start by first telling us a little bit about how you decided to do a book on a topic that everybody wants a piece of, uh, but most people don't really want to know the actual history. It doesn't help their side. The idea came to me actually, um, uh, partly when we were talking um, mm -hmm. on my Frank, uh, Franklin and Washington book, mm -hmm. um, but when I was going around the country. Now, Franklin and Washington book came out just before the pandemic. Washington's birthday, the year of the pandemic. And I was midway through my book tour. I think I'd made it to San Francisco. I was mm -hmm. halfway through my book tour when everything shut down for, for COVID. And I had to fly back before I got to D.C. And I, I made it to D.C. I hadn't made it to Morristown in Philadelphia yet in Boston. And what, what I found out is I had traced, that book had traced the, uh, the interactions of Franklin and Washington, the two greatest men of the revolution, the two greatest people of the revolution, the two people who all historians agree, it wouldn't have worked without them. Um, they were the indispensable men. Biographies of both books had called each of them the first American. And I traced their interaction. Nobody had done that before. Sort of a dual biography, going back to the French and Indian War way back in the 1750s. But what people were so interested in what really surprised me was wherever I went, and I guess it was the times, things that were developing on, on these issues in America, but everybody was asking me about the last chapter. You were, everyone was asking me about the last chapter, because the last chapter is their final encounter. 
after the Constitutional Convention, where both compromise the heck out of everything, but get their ultimate goal, a stronger federal union. But by this time, earlier, Franklin had turned on slavery. And he, by this time, he was governor of Pennsylvania, or president, they called it, the chief executive of Pennsylvania, host of the Constitutional Convention. But he was also president of the first abolitionist society in the New World. Mm -hmm. And he had become an abolitionist, even though in youth he had owned a, a couple enslaved people. Washington, of course, was a major slaveholder, over 100 of his own, and uh, control over a couple hundred more of his um, that his wife had a dour slavery. And they went head to head at the end. After Washington, after the Constitution was out, what Franklin decided to go against it in his last act. And Washington was defending slavery. And so we saw them. And Madison was, of course, leading the, because Washington never did anything up front. Madison was leading the effort, but we have all the private letters. And people were fascinated by that encounter. The two greatest Americans of the Revolutionary Era, the two you know, parents of American liberty fighting over this issue. And people wanted to know more. And then the COVID hit. And so uh, my editor suggested, why don't you just expand it, write the whole story? And it became my COVID project. I couldn't go anywhere anyways. And I had an enormous amount of materials. And thanks to how much of the revolutionary era material is digitalized, um, but also I did a lot of, I did take some trips and I uh, plowed some archives and also archivists there were, weren't doing too much. So some were collecting things for me. And I was really, I just tackled this issue with the full force of a person trapped in his room for two years. <laughs> <laughs> I wish everybody's COVID time has been that productive. Uh, that's not that common. <laughs> so Ed, um, we're going to go back kind of chronologically, but before we do that, it's not, it wasn't just Franklin and Washington that had a disagreement about this. What I think you uncovered was a, a whole range of people and a whole range of ideas about what should be done. But one of the things that I wanted to mention right up front was how many people pointed out, you know, we're being very hypocritical telling the British that we need liberty when we don't give liberty to our slaves. And those comments were made by people in America and they were made by people in England. So why don't you tell a little bit about that and then we'll kind of go back to, to the how it led up to it um, in the colonies. That's absolutely true. And it was in part because England did not have slavery. Slavery, and this is what I think, this is one of the many things that I didn't understand how critically important this was um, and how everybody back then knew it. Um, overall, what surprised me is how much people thought about this whole issue, how deeply they understood, it. and not just the leaders, just mm -hmm. as we saw from the debates in the newspapers and at the, uh, at the various uh, counties that I uncovered, people down at every level and at the churches and the sermons. But Eng England had hadn't had slavery since Roman times. When Rome was driven out of England, slavery ended in England. And um, the, I mean, they had villainage, which is you know where you're tied to a, a land and a manor um, mm -hmm. where you work on the manor, but it's nothing like the chattel slavery that developed in America. And that actually came through Barbados to South Carolina in the late 1600s. Um, and it came to South Carolina from Brazil, where it had been imported by the Portuguese. And that's why the first enslaved people brought to America were typically brought in Portuguese ships. Because if you remember the, your, your high school history, um, mm -hmm. Portugal tried to get around to China, where Spain sent Columbus and then hit the, it hit the New World. Uh, Portugal was trying to go around Africa. And by doing that, they had gone around North Africa, which was controlled by um, the Arabs, and came down to Sub-Saharan Africa, and they had trading bases, San Tome, what became Angola, Mozambique, those places. And there they encountered a, a form of slavery, which they then exported to their sugar plantations in Brazil, 
and then went from the sugar plantation to Brazil to the sugar plantations in the non-Spanish Caribbean, in, in the Dutch, English, and French. And from Barbados, it went to, went to um, South Carolina. And so there you now have, in to get to your question, you have developing in English colonies a property in people that was abhorrent in England, unthinkable in England. And when they and when these people from South Carolina, you know, they're now some of the richest people in all the empire. They send their sons over to study at Oxford or Cambridge or they send their sons over to study law at the ends of the court or they buy a big mansion in England. Um, they want to bring their enslaved valets, their enslaved house workers, and they can't. They're free. And that creates so that creates a tension between the colonies who suddenly feel we're second class citizens. England doesn't treat us as equal. We're making all the money for it. And then when some of those states like Virginia, which has a surplus um, or Pennsylvania, which has the Quakers and do not like the institution, when they try to end the importation of more enslaved people, the King of England vetoes them. They says no. And that hypocrisy on both sides. And so the British are sneering at the Americans and probably the, there's so many that do this, but probably the most famous was Samuel Johnson in a incredibly widely quoted line where he says, well, I just, this is during the beginning of the revolution. Well, I just wish um, the Yelps for Liberty wasn't coming people who were driving their enslaved people. Um, right. And Americans were saying the same thing. There were a lot of Americans noticing the same. And it led to the first big, I mean, before that, sure, some Quakers had opposed slavery, but Quakers were an odd group and an isolated group um, because of their religion and because of their attitudes. But no, it went mainline with people mm -hmm. like James Otis and uh, uh, John Hancock and Samuel Adams, uh, really, and then Lafayette when he came over, um, uh, Henry Lawrence uh, and Benjamin Franklin, who we've already mentioned, turning on slavery and seeing this is totally inconsistent of what we're asking for. So you did this became a, a revolutionary issue. Now, I want to uh, peel back the layers a little bit on a couple of things you said, because they're fascinating little details. You say, for example, that Bar in the move from Barbados to South Carolina was pushing out the small farmers, the small landholders, because sugar plantations were being brought in from Brazil, and that worked on a big scale with lots of slaves. And so uh, another group of British uh, landholders were pushed out, and they went to South Carolina, but brought their slaves. That's how it got there, right? So, it did. In yeah. fact, it was pre-thought, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, South The Carolinas became a colony uh, when uh, Charles II was restored in England, which would have been, what, in 1660, um, right around there. And so some of it, for some of his supporters, he gave the land south of Virginia, between Virginia and what was then extended Spanish domains, which reached up into Georgia at first. Mm -hmm. And so he gave that to a, a group of his supporters, all nobles, uh, and they were going to exploit it. And they used John Locke, no other than life, liberty, and property, John Locke, <laughs> constitution for the Carolinas. And they knew where they were going to get settlers because by this time, all the colonies, you know, you had a very healthy Virginia, Massachusetts, New York. Um, um, New York was Dutch, of course. Um, Pennsylvania was coming. Maryland was already going well. And so you had a competition for settlers. And they knew there were all these Barbatans and they wanted to get these small farmers, as you said, to move there. They also got some French Huguenots who were brewing out of French. But what John Locke writes right into the Constitution, the Fundamentals Constitution of, of Carolinas, is, is he said, every white person shall have his right over enslaved blacks. He writes that in absolute power. He writes it in it because... Be, the common law did not in England did not allow hereditary slavery. 
you could have lifetime indentured servants. And that's what the first enslaved people carried by the Portuguese to Virginia in 1619. The Virginians didn't know how to handle them. Lifetime indentured servants? Yeah, but that's very different than chattel slavery because chattel slavery, those human beings are no different than a cow or a horse. And that means their offspring by the mother are also enslaved. And that's not true with a, a, a lifetime indentured servant. I'm not defending lifetime indentured servitude. I'm just mm. saying chattel slavery was different. And that's what under Locke's constitution, because you need positive law. You're a lawyer. You know that mm. you can't do it by common law. Then you can do anything under property law. You just make right. a statute. And so thanks to John Locke, Carolina had that statute. So up came the Barbatan smallholders. And what's amazing is they the the, the people who are going to run South Carolina, the um, the nobles who get it. They know they want to. They know what makes money: plantation crops. They did not even know what plantation crop would work in the Carolinas. What they found was rice. They didn't know that when they came, but they found that a, that sugar didn't work there. They tried, but mm. around um, Charleston, you have those swampy, marshy areas that are perfect for rice. And rice doesn't make as much money as sugar, but it's a good cash crop. Better at the time than tobacco, even. And and rice doesn't grow in Virginia really, and so. They um, and rice, like sugar, is perfect for enslaved labor because it's so vicious. Husking rice is like processing uh, sugar in that hot Caribbean sun. Mm. No free white person will no free black person either will do it. And Mm. so you need to bring in um, to be profitable at a level you need or you or it helps at least to have in slave labor. So it turns out slavery was pre-authorized. People brought their enslaved workers, enslaved African workers from Barbados, and they hit pay dirt. It's interesting, I think, you know, we're so far from that period of time um, that the agricultural facts on the ground made such a big difference. What land was good for what, what, you know, what crops will grow where, Etc., and that, that that was a determining factor. But before we let the British off the hook altogether, although the British <laughs> never had uh, you know a, a positive law in England in favor of uh, slavery, they did not have any law against the slave trade, and were making a lot of money on the slave trade. So it, it, what, what I think is interesting about your book is the different degrees, people who were engaged in the slave trade yelling about the people who, you know, looking down on the people who actually have the slaves that they sell them to, et cetera. But, um, but one of the facts that I don't, I don't know if you mentioned in your book or not, but obviously the British passed a law against the slave trade earlier. And there were, there were other ones, but they passed it in, the, in like 1830s or something like that. They, they certainly passed it before it got to the civil war, uh, our civil war time. So, so, so there are some people who say if we hadn't had the American revolution, slavery would have come to an end in America faster, but you all, Oh, well, one point on that, um, the United States had already stopped the Atlantic slave trade by then for itself. They mm-hmm. had banned the Atlantic slave trade in 1808. So yeah. the fact that England later stopped it didn't matter for the, but they, intend, I'm sure we'll get to it later, but that was a debate at the Constitutional Convention that, that the people who had turned against slavery, the Northern states mm-hmm. by this time because the revolutionary war as we'll say as we'll see is the is the first great emancipation in the in the north slavery was abolished but even virginia had turned against the slave trade because the slave trade was particularly brutal as bad as slavery was the slave trade everyone could see because you're wrenching children from their families throwing them on these awful ships where one in 10 would die and um, that, and then you're, and then people don't like immigrants anyway, and then you're bringing more immigrants. So Virginia even had opposed it, but Virginia had enough enslaved people already that they had a surplus, so they could sell them. So if they could close the import of new enslaved people, they'd have a better market for their own surplus population. And it was after the war, so many of the enslaved people in the South Carolina and Georgia had been freed during the revolution that they needed to reboot, but they calculated within 20 years, if we let this, if we allow in the constitution that they can end it after 1808, but 
they couldn't end it before it. We will have a surplus and then we can sell our surplus to enslaved people to the opening territories of what will become Alabama, Mississippi. So there is hypocrisy and there is monetary interest running throughout this story. Yeah, it's fascinating, you know, that they made this calculation, as you said, they got Virginia to agree with the northern states because Virginia had already too many slaves to put them to effective use. Um, so they agreed that within 20 years, it will leave, leave the slave trade open for 20 years and then we'll cut it off. But that will allow us. And even the earlier thing that you mentioned, which I'm, I'm just quoting from your book here, um, that Virginia asked the king to outlaw the, the, the slave trade. It was really just to increase the value of their own slaves. They knew it was a politically wise thing to do uh, or, or politically uh, manipulative thing to do to get the king to say no to it. Um, but, but they had monetary reasons for it, right? Well, they had monetary reasons, that? but you said just for monetary reasons. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm not willing to judge them that harshly. Mm. I, these people, when you read the writings of, of the people involved with pushing that legislation, whether it be Washington or Mason or Jefferson, they really thought slavery was wrong. And they did want to end the, and they thought the slave trade was especially wrong. And so, yes, the monetary coincided with the moral and mm -hmm. that, but I do think both were involved. And if you read Jefferson's initial draft of the Declaration of Independence, when he lists the laundry list of things that he holds against the king, that the therefore the uh, Second Continental Congress holds against the king, that justified revolution, prominent among them was vetoing legislation that would end the Atlantic slave trade. It was only that the Georgia and the Carolinas that insisted that be withdrawn or they wouldn't agree to the Declaration of Independence. But Jefferson put it in it. He'd put it in a he'd put it in his pamphlet that came out before. In fact, the reason why he was appointed, he was not original member of the Second Continental Congress, but he'd written this powerful pamphlet. And when uh, Peyton Randolph was made governor of Virginia, Peyton Randolph, who was president of the Second Continental Congress, left. And then they the Virginia had to appoint a replacement. And because of Jefferson's powerful pamphlet, which included an indictment for uh, King George vetoing Virginia's limitation on the importation of slavery, they chose Jefferson. So they knew that got, they were getting someone who could, who could, who was an incredibly gifted writer who could make the case against poor independence and against the King sing. And that was Thomas Jefferson. Well, that that little compromise for 20 years, uh, you, you said that 200,000 more uh, slaves were imported during those 20 years. That's 10,000 a year and only into the Georgias and the Carolinas, basically. More were imported during that period, or at least as many as mm -hmm. the entire period, colonial period before that. That is more came in then than you had before. And of course, by doing that, the number of enslaved blacks in America mushroomed mm. because you had had so many removed because Britain had a policy of liberating the the enslaved people of patriots and um, and took many out after the war. And so this just ballooned the population. And yes, it was only in those states because what the Constitution says is the, the reason it became an issue is um, the reason why Franklin and Washington and Hamilton and the others wanted a new constitution was because there, as everyone knows, is there weren't, they didn't think the Confederation Congress under the Articles of Confederation had enough power. Basically what they wanted at least was something like a European common market because every state before the constitution was sovereign. So they could build up trade barriers. They all had their own money. They could build up trade barriers against other states. And the people like Franklin and, and Washington and Hamilton, they thought we want to have a national market economy and therefore grow the economy for everybody. So that meant the central government would have power over interstate and international commerce, which it didn't have before. Before that, if you wanted to ban imports, New York could or Rhode Island could, but you know it only applied to that one 
uh, one state. So, and the federal government was going to get its money by taxing imports. Well, that means the federal government would have power over the importation of enslaved people as well, because they have total power over imports. And of course, if you count the states, if you add Maryland and Virginia and Delaware, all of which wanted to limit the Atlantic slave trade for economic as well as moral reasons, plus the seven northern states, which had either had abolished or were in the process of abolishing slavery, well, you could pass it. And so the South, the deep South, Virginia, uh, uh, Georgia, and the Carolinas wanted this protection. So they put in 20 years because they only wanted 20 years because by 20 years they'd have enough and they wanted to be the one profiting from that. But the provision Mm -hmm. actually reads that not everybody can bring in enslaved, only states that choose to. It's a weird provision of the Constitution. It's Mm -hmm. a provision that simply allowed states that wanted to continue to bring in enslaved people could. So only Georgia and the Carolinas could bring them in, nobody else. And it was that provision that raised the most objection among anti-federalists and even moderate federalists in the North. That led to the the Constitution being rejected the first time in New Hampshire and almost going down in um, Massachusetts. They just, that one provision, more so than the three-fifths compromise, more so than Mm -hmm. the other things. It was that you could keep this abominable process going. And they think if the federal government is good for anything, it's at least can stop the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I want you to, to lay out for people in the great detail that you have in your book, not all the details, but in, in, in great detail, the three-fifths compromise. As a as a mergers and acquisitions uh, lawyer, first when I first came across this issue forty years ago, I thought to myself, okay, one side said I want everybody represented. One side said no, only one half the value, and the stronger side ended up with three fifths as a compromise because they had a little bit more leverage in the negotiations. And you you make it very clear that that this three fifths compromise had to do with one issue. And it didn't have to do, it was, it was for popular representation in Congress. It didn't have to do with moral worth. It didn't have to do with, you know, how the, the slaves were, were thought of. They were thought of as not individuals and not at all. They were thought of as zero more than, than three-fifths, which is even worse. But they weren't thought of as three-fifths of a person. But why don't you explain sort of a little bit of the, of the run-through for the three-fifths compromise? Because that, that really, I don't think very many people sort of, understand that. That's another issue that is used polemically uh, for good reason. It's a terrible provision, but it's used polemically inaccurately in order to say everybody that was involved in, you know, had an awful idea about the slaves. So, Well, you're right. And thank you for bringing that up. Now it's the compromise in the con- in the Constitution that people point to. My students mm-hmm. do, people do. Back then, if you look to abolitionists back then, and anti-slavery people back then, the ones they hated the most at the time were the ones we just talked about, the right. fact that you could continue to bring in enslaved people for another 20 years that's guaranteed in the Constitution and the Fugitive Slave Clause. Um, mm-hmm. The fact that um, by this time, the northern states, several of them had abolished slavery. And so... Um, Enslaved people were fleeing places like Virginia and Maryland and crossing over to Pennsylvania, and they were free, or Massachusetts. One, and, one little detail. One little detail to throw in here because you brought it up before. The British during the Revolutionary War offered freedom to any slave that would join their side and fight for them. And how many? How many did that? In, any, in the any um, thousands and th- uh, tens thousands, thousands and thousands. Yeah. Um, any, but be more precise. Okay. Let's any be precise. enslaved person. Of a patriot, not an yes, enslaved yes, yes. person of a loyalist. Right, right, right. Enslaved person of a patriot. <laughs> um, if they fled, if they went behind British lines, um, they became free, and um, they, and and England honored that after the war. They shipped them mm-hmm. out. Um, and I want to make a comparison. An enormous here. emancipation. I want to make a comparison. First of all, Lincoln kind of learned from that. But the comparison that I wanted to ask you about was the British 
And they obviously did it for totally political purposes, because as you said, they did it to only to the slaves of the loyalists, just like Lincoln would say, I'm not going to say anything about the slaves in Kentucky because they're a border state. Right. And so I'll I'll say about slaves in another area. But we just left Afghanistan. And and we had all kinds of people that helped us and we left most of them behind. And I and and there's a little bit of that uh, among the Brits. But I'll, they spent a lot of time and effort to move those slaves out of the country. So why don't you say about that? Because it, 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 I don't, I don't want to make us look bad, but you know, th- this is yeah. this political expediency is sometimes, you know, the, the 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 principle that was used for political expediency is sometimes honored and sometimes not. Uh, George, you're very astute. I had not even thought of that parallel, but you're right. The British, by the time uh, after Yorktown. And it took um, two years before everything was settled Um, and the peace treaty was signed and then executed. Um, The British had retreated just as we did in Afghanistan. Americans did in Afghanistan to uh, the capital. Um, They had retreated back to New York, Charleston and Savannah. And they had enough troops to prevent the Americans from attacking them there. And what they were able to do was to have an orderly retreat. And so it took months in each case. And the British were meticulous. They took notes, they wrote down. And so we have their ledgers of how many people, and they were very careful. All the, as they had retreated back to those three cities, they had the, um, the formerly enslaved blacks who had fled to their lines, retreated back with them so that those cities were filled with um, blacks who had formerly been the property of patriots and now were living behind lines. They had odd jobs. They would work for the British or they would be seamstresses, they'd be whatever. And when the British left, they brought in ship after ship after ship and they systematically took it down, took them out and they kept lists and including the former owners. So you can read those lists and they have like, like Harry Washington, former enslaved, of George Washington, home, Mount Vernon. I mean, or Mm. or formerly enslaved person of Thomas Jefferson, um, Mount Pelier, Um, or formerly enslaved person of James Madison. Um, And uh, that would be Mount Pelier. The other, of course, would be um, uh, Monticello. And it was, they're just books. They're the, the freedom books. And you can read these lists. And they did it very systematically. They did have more time. Um, and um, they had brute force. And meanwhile, people like George Washington, uh, various people whose enslaved property, former enslaved property, were behind those lines. They would send in agents and either try to get them and bring them out or try to convince them, oh, come home and you'll be treated differently. And to a person, they said, no, we're getting out of here. <laughs> and they were sailed out in the in the ships. And I am able to recount those really touching stories. And some of their accounts mm-hmm. afterwards and the things they'd say, a lot went to, some went to England, a lot went to Nova Scotia. Some were resettled in uh, Liberia um, by the British. Um, but they're, they're really moving stories. Um, these African-Americans had agency. The British mm-hmm. gave them agency. They knew what they were doing. Um, they're not, they're not, a, it's not a mindless mass here. These people, mm-hmm. this was really a cooperative work between Africans and white people. And um, they're deeply involved on both sides. Uh, but you uh, you asked the question about the three-fifths, the three-fifths right. conference. And the Three-Fifths Compromise had actually come on an entirely different basis. It was Madison's idea, James Madison. But it's not at the Constitutional Convention. It's back at the, um, so you can tell, you bring it up. It is a long story. I'll try to be, mm-hmm. I'll try to be short. Um, it had come up during, Madison was a member of Con- Virginia delegate to the um, Articles of Confederation Congress under the the. Congress under the Articles of Confederation. And they had tried to, the problem, one of the many problems with the Articles of Confederation is they didn't give the central government any independent taxing authority. They could only ask the states for revenue and the states didn't have to give it. 
And the result is they had no money. And after the revolution, <laughs> nobody would keep contributing. And as a result is the, the United States couldn't defend its borders, couldn't defend the frontier, a whole variety of problems. And so there were various pushes to try to get money. And one of them, the pushes was enforced sort of allocations and uh, or or some sort of taxation. And so the question is, how do we do it? And one of the means, and they proposed various amendments to the Article of Confederation to get this taxing power. All of them ended up failing, never getting, because they had to get all 13 states to agree, and they never got 13. But one of the proposals that Madison had pushed would have been allocation duty, uh, contributions by the states. And then the country, well, how do we determine how much? We can't all pay the same. Nobody lives in Delaware. A lot of people live in Pennsylvania. How do we, how do we figure out these numbers? And so they thought about, okay, the wealth of each state. But how do we calculate the wealth of each state? And But they did have censuses back then. And so they decided, well, it's got to be population. Well, the obvious issue is what population? An enslaved person is not doesn't generate as much money as a free person. So the South said it should only be the free people. Well, if you only count the free people, South Carolina doesn't have many free people. I mean, there are over half enslaved people back then. And... So um, so they wouldn't pay much, while Massachusetts, which had a population, if you didn't include it overall, but only you know five or so percent were enslaved, they would have to pay a lot more. And so they work back and forth, and Madison comes up with a compromise, okay, for tax purposes. And for tax purposes, most people say this is pretty fair. For tax purposes, that is how much the whole state has to pay in to the um, central government you would count each enslaved person as three-fifths on the idea that they generate about three-fifths of the wealth of a free person. Who knows mm -hmm. if that's true, but it ends up equalizing the, um, the tax burden. You can justify that because no individual is paying it. It's coming from the whole state. So it's a measure of wealth. Uh, I mean, it still sounds pretty disgusting, but um, what happens at the Constitutional Convention is they're in an impasse. They're debating representation, they're debating two things, electing the president and, um, or chief executive, and choosing the lower house, the House of Representatives. How do we divide this up? They'd already decided we're gonna, um, each state's gonna get an equal number of senators. They didn't know how many, but each mm -hmm. getting equal number. So Delaware would get the same as Pennsylvania, but states like Pennsylvania, back then, the three biggest states were, if you count everybody, Virginia, mm -hmm. Massachusetts, and Pennsylvania. Um, mm -hmm. For free people, it would be Massachusetts, uh, Pennsylvania, and then Virginia. Um, and so those states, hmm. um, we want division based on, well, what? And do we want to count enslaved people, or do we just want to count free people? And the North, of course, wants to count just free people because for two reasons. First, they get a bigger count. South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina are diminished greatly mm -hmm. in both represent vote for the president and vote for Congress, number of representatives. This is just the reverse of the original use of three-fifths. Absolutely. They haven't the, got the, the parties who wanted it are just reversed. Yeah, just reversed. Yeah. They want the North wants just free people. And and they argue right at the convention. They argue not only is this fair because only free people are going to be able to vote. Nobody's going to let enslaved people vote. They're not going to vote. So only free people are going to vote and actually only male free people, um, but only free people. And adults you are going to have those limitations in most states. The South, of course, wants everyone to count, including enslaved people, because it'll help their numbers. So that's it. So it's reversed, where in contrast, um, the North wants free people, the South wants everybody. Um, but Madison remembers this old compromise that had gotten that he had proposed. That's why he probably mm -hmm. remembered it. Mm 
that had gotten through the continent, the Confederation Congress a few years before, but had never been ratified by all the states. So it was not an effect. So it was a, and so he throws that out and says, well, as a compromise, let's take three fifths instead of all the people and, mm-hmm. or just the, just the free people. Now to show how f- that began in the beginning, you may remember that the constitutional convention begins with Virginia offering the Virginia plan, the Virginia pl- uh, governor Randolph, the Virginia plan was actually drafted by the Virginia and Pennsylvania delegations because the Virginia delegation, the Pennsylvania delegations were the first to show up and the rest didn't show up for two weeks. And they had two weeks to write a plan. Mm -hmm. That plan, even when these two groups are talking, Pennsylvania and Virginia, of course they're split on this issue. So if you read the Virginia plan carefully, it says the lower house of the Congress or will be chosen and each state will have proportional representation that is based on population. And it says either by the number of free people or the total number of people, whichever seems most expedient. So they were kicking, the only way they could even agree is they were kicking it ahead. And then (laughs) if you read further, the lower house picks the Senate so that whatever the proportional representation in the house will carry over to the Senate because they get to pick the senators and Congress picks the president. So this, it's all then turns on whether the South has power or the North, do we count everybody or do we count just the free people? And again, it's reversed. And you get these wonderful, you get these telling statements by Northerners who hated slavery, like um, Governor Morris from Pennsylvania or, or Elderberg Jerry, from Massachusetts, future governor, future vice president, um, or uh, uh, James Wilson, future uh, justice of the Supreme Court, or Ben Franklin um, from Pennsylvania. They're saying, how can you count everyone? You're not letting these enslaved people vote. I mean, you might, they're just property. We should, if you count them, we should count our horses and our cows. They literally mm. say that. Mm. Um, and and I'm, I'm smiling, but it just hits to the course. They knew what was at stake. And so Madison mm. offers a three-fifths because what three-fifths does, he knew it flew, but it had worked before. But what the three-fifths compromise does as a practical matter, is it makes the slates with slavery that is below the Mason-Dixon line, the six states with slavery end up having equal representation with the six, seven states above. It's amazing the numbers work. They only had a rough guesstimate, but they sort of knew how many people. And if you use three fifths, that's why it's an effective political compromise. Of course, each side, one side tries to make it. Well, let's make it a half. The other side, let's make it three fourths. Uh, No, three fifths is what actually works to give equal power. And then the Senate, since the Senate has already moved to two for each state, Well, that was going to be equal, too, because even though there were seven northern states and six southern states with slavery, six, seven free states, they knew that as soon as the country was formed, Vermont was coming in as a state and would be a free state or already had abolished slavery by its constitution. And they knew Tennessee and Kentucky were coming in and they knew, therefore, the numbers were going to be eight and eight dead tie. And then it would be a race to settle Ohio and Alabama, and they could see already, we're gonna keep balance. And then, of course, then at the last minute, they still can't figure out how to pick the president um, to lay on top of this, because the North, Wilson and Governor Morris and Franklin, they all want popular vote for president. Let everybody, let everybody vote. Well, let every count the number of votes nationwide, popular vote. The Southern states say, Madison says, we can't have that because you are let everybody vote. New Jersey is already letting women vote. Uh, mm-hmm. Pennsylvania lets all adult males vote. It doesn't matter if they own property or don't. It doesn't matter if they're 
Some states, Massachusetts, doesn't matter whether they're black or white, they can, as long as they're free, they can vote and everybody's free. Massachusetts doesn't have slavery anymore. And so a Southerner will never be elected president because you have this disproportionate voting. So they come, they invent the Electoral College as a way that you get your number of electors based on the three-fifths compromise mm -hmm. because it counts the number of members of the House. And therefore, the South gets its boost for the three-fifths compromise. The North it doesn't. And then it suddenly doesn't matter how many people vote. So it allows a state to suppress the voting. They can suppress the heck out of voting. They can let not let women vote. They cannot let uh, any blacks vote, whether they're free or not. And there are, are a fair number of free blacks in Virginia. You can suppress the vote. You can have high property qualifications and you still get the same number of electoral votes. So it was a device from the beginning used to facilitate the suppression of voting. And funny thing, it still is. Yeah, it's a very a clear perspective to watch the whole progress from the revolution to the Civil War of a race, as you were saying, a race to try to keep the power even between the South. So the people who say that that uh, America was founded on slavery and others who say America was founded on liberty, they're getting it each half right because the one, one half of it was founded on one, one half was founded on the other. And they made a political compromise to keep it that way so that they could have country. Did, was there any strong I, urge historically at that time to have two different countries and to just split between those the Southern and the Northern states? I, I've never read about it. Not a strong urge, um, but first I'd say, you said they both had it half right and they both have it half wrong. Right, exactly, um, yeah. It, 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 <laughs> there's, there's two sides, the glass is half full or class em empty. Yeah. And so when people use the revolutionary period, what my what I try to, what I and think I end up doing in the book is partisans are using this on both sides as a shuttlecock and mm. Um, this truly was, um, it's not just about slavery or liberty. The revolution mm -hmm. is about liberty and slavery. And yeah. um, so you don't do it justice if you make it a slave constitution, you don't slavery constitution, you don't do it justice, you make it a liberty constitution. It was a complex. Mm -hmm. And that debate was recognized at the time in the ratification debates, but it was also during the antebellum period. That's what Frederick Douglass and um, uh, Garrison split. Uh, is this, a, is this a, a slavery constitution or is this a potentially a liberty constitution? It's both. And um, that's the subtlety of it. And people knew that at the time. There was some movement, um, not overwhelming movement, because um, the economic forces um, and of a national market economy that included both North where there was the um, industry and the South where there was the production of, of plantation crops and, and um, goods that, and commodities that were important um, for that national market economy. Plus the middle States, which were producing the foodstuffs. The, na the, the arguments for a national market economy were so strong that people with that vision, and those were the Washingtons as well as the Franklins and the Hamiltons and the Pinckneys, the vast slave slave owners in, in South Carolina. They realized that and they therefore pushed for union. But no, people like Patrick Henry um, pushed for a, just a Southern, um, a Southern um, uh, union. Uh, mm. And so there, and there were also Northerners who said, um, who so opposed slavery. The, and they said, we don't want to be part of these states where slavery was entrenched and was never going away. And mm -hmm. so it's a funny thing. I have a whole chapter where I followed the debate, the state-by-state -state debate over ratification. And mm -hmm. the anti-federalists in the North were almost all, invariably anti-slavery, where the anti-federalists so the anti-federalists in the North were anti-slavery, where the anti-federalists in the South were almost invariably pro-slavery. And so the people, James Madison said repeatedly at the Constitutional Convention, it's in his notes, um, he recorded, he repeatedly said, I don't know what you guys are talking about. This is not a battle 
drafting of this constitution is not a battle between the big states and the little states. It's just not. Mm. It's a battle between the states with slavery and those without. That's mm. the real divide. The little st- you're trying to make this a battle over big states versus li- it's not because mm-hmm. the the small states without slavery are li- aligned with the big states without slavery. It, the, mm. the division here, the thing that's going to that the the thing we have to bridge is the slavery issue because that's the fundamental divide. And Governor Morris, who was the penman of the Constitution, he's he's the one who wrote the preamble. He is. Um, if you look at the most important people there, it'd be he would be one of the five, along with Franklin, Washington, uh, Madison, um, Wilson, uh, maybe a couple others, Sherman, Hamilton. He said, this, these compromises are going to lead to civil war. I mean, he mm-hmm. just said, this is never going to work. It's going to be civil war. He ended up voting for it, but he said, this division is unbridgeable. So people knew it then. Mm -hmm. And we are still living, well, the Electoral College. The Electoral College is only there because of slavery. And we're still living with the consequences or the impacts, good and bad, of the Electoral College. So just because slavery ended because of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, all of the effects of slavery, I mean, another thing that Slavery led to slavery is why we have enumerated powers. The there's mm-hmm. not enumerated powers of the, of the federal government in the Virginia plan. But once Randolph realizes how divisive this issue, he wants enumerated powers, and it's one reason why we didn't originally have a Bill of Rights because Bill of mm-hmm. Rights then always began with the phrase, you know, all men are born equal, and um, they were afraid what a Bill of Rights might say. And the tenth, uh, the tenth uh, of the Bill of Rights, the Tenth Amendment, is the one that allows to the states whatever the government doesn't do, and that leaves the states in charge of that issue. Well, the Bill of Rights, not only that, but th- I'm talking about why they didn't have the Bill of Rights in the original. No, in the first place, yeah. When it's pressured, um, Madison writes a Bill of Rights, um, but the Bill of Rights really is a limitation only on the federal government. You look at, just take the first one. Congress mm-hmm. shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or free exercise thereof, or let the states free to do it. Right. Um, 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 the, the, the right about bearing arms is encased in a phrase because of the importance of the states to have militias. Um, mm-hmm. Everything you can view as states' rights so it doesn't touch on um it limits the federal government, but it doesn't limit the state government. So it the, a reg- before the 14th Amendment, before the incorporation debate, the, the, the Bill of Rights was carefully crafted not to adjust the compromises that allowed the United States under the Constitution to be half free and half slavery. Before we finish with the three-fifths altogether, you know, the government, the government is there to try to keep an even uh, playing field. I mean, that's the theory. But but I think what was fascinating about your book was uh, under the articles, the first proposal to use three fifths. One of the uh, one of the observers of that, I don't remember the name, but one of the observers said this is the best method because this was an attempt to uh, lower taxation. This is the best method to increase and, you know, and, 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 and enhance and so on slavery. Because for every slave you have, you have, you have to pay less in your taxes. And, you know, if, if a corporation is running that and then you give them a rule to, that gives them a way to decrease their taxes, they, that's an incentive to do it. So there's that. But then when it got reversed in the Constitution so that the other side wanted the three-fifths, then you could say that because you only get three-fifths of a vote for every slave, there's an incentive to free your slaves so that you have more voting power. You know, I mean, that was never used, but at least the incentive was there. And so the first use of it that, that didn't get put into effect was to uh, the incentive was to increase slavery. The second use was in, in the Constitution was to decrease or, or incentivize slavery. Neither one had that big of an effect, but it's interesting to watch the playing field maneuvers, you know, the, 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 the attempt to not have a level playing field, but to push your side in, in these negotiations. Absolutely um, true. And indeed, on the on that line, the second one plays both ways, as you can well guess, because right. 
Northerners or anti-slavery people in the North during the ratification debates say, to the extent they criticized the Three-Fifths Amendment, was saying this is giving an incentive to Southern states, so states with slavery, to bring in more states, sla- enslaved people, because the more enslaved people they do, they may not get a whole vote, but at least get three fifths. So there mm-hmm. is some in- the incentives are subtle, um, but they do they certainly were discussed. But I also agree with you. I don't know of because they're so subtle. I don't know if people actually actively acting on them simply to increase their power because they sort of cut both ways. But it certainly was a polemic used at the time, both for and against it. it just as you say. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating you know, background. Now, um, for people to understand this whole range, idealists against slavery, partisans in favor of slavery, politicians who lean in those both directions and, and, and compromise, you know, but, but, but have as their forefront political uh, agendas and then totally amoral politicians in the middle who, who, who don't really care, but are just looking to see in which way this works the best. So that whole range is working. Is there an area of our 21st century politics that, that, you know, is, at least somewhat analogous to that. So that people can understand that when we talk about this thing from 250 years ago or almost 250 years ago, that we really are, are talking about something that's very much like today in terms of the range. And therefore it's very hard to say it was either one thing or another. It's a, it's a combination of so many different points of view. That's what, what democracy is supposed to be. So is there, yeah. That's a, that's a fascinating question, George. Um, and one I, I, I haven't really dealt with before, but I would say you've got it to, to get an answer to that question. You've got to think of a huge divisive issue mm-hmm. with morality on 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 the various sides. And so if, if you think of the two big issues today, they would be guns, gun control, gun rights and versus gun control and, and, and abortion. And mm-hmm. I think there are probably some parallels because. You look back then, and it's just as you said. And that's what the book teases out. The book is not, I don't think it's a judgmental book. It's Mm -hmm. not a book where there's a clear right and wrong. I'm trying to just lay out the history in a way that people can understand the history of what actually happened. And then you you figure out what you're going to do with this, if this is what happened back then. And so you had people who were morally, fundamentally morally opposed to slavery back then. Mm. Um, and, and one thing that really strikes me is how people back then understood the nuances of these issues. I mean, I'm not making up these nuances. They were discussing in their public, le- in their private letters, and not just the leaders, we're talking about common people to, um, in their newspaper letters to the editor, in the debates over ratification of the constitution or their state constitutions, um, in the ratif- they were, they were, they were thinking in very detailed terms. And so you had a group, a growing group of people because originally before the revolution, it had just been the Quakers who were opposed to slavery and the enslaved people themselves, of course. Um, you, you, you mentioned several examples. You mentioned several examples where where slaves and and freed slaves are are involved in the process of the discussion, and I, I I recommend that highly as part of the book. We won't go into it, but it's fascinating how many and how persistent a few of them were coming back again and again and again. You know, you're being hypocritical. So I, I just wanted to throw that yeah. in as a recommendation. They're writing for your book. petitions. They're writing newspaper yeah. articles, both free and enslaved Africans, where they can in states like Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. Um, And they're they're fully engaged. But so you see the people. What happens during the revolution is you get two huge new groups that join the abolition movement. Um, And they are um, the New Light Congregationalists, New Light Protestants in the north, uh, Mm -hmm. sort of the descendants of the Second Great Awakening. The descendants, not Jonathan Edwards himself. He was Mm -hmm. he owned enslaved people. But his followers. And so the North was 
profoundly influenced by these groups, and to a lesser extent, the Dutch Reformed, the Methodist, other groups in the North, turned vehemently against uh, slavery, see, arguing for a consistency, but also a bunch of the patriot leaders, people like, like Hancock and John Hancock and Samuel Adams and, and, and James Otis, and some from even Southern states like Henry Lawrence, and um, to a lesser extent, Hamilton say, and and Benjamin Franklin. And so they're coming more from a from a, a revolutionary sort of non-religious viewpoint. So you get this strength. And so they want to abolish slavery. They're a poor to it. George Bryant, a, a normal politician, gets so uh, uh, vice governor of Pennsylvania for most of the time, uh, head of the second largest party. He pushes the first statute to a abolish slavery. It passes in Pennsylvania in the middle of the revolution, right smack dab in the middle of the revolution. He pushes it with a vengeance. Where is this coming from? He's a Presbyterian. Where did he ever, he just gets caught up with it and he drives and drives and gets it passed. Um, and so you have those people, but then you have other people who are clutching on to slavery and then you get your typical politician in the middle. Well, how far do I have to go this way in this state? Or how far do I have to go that way? And you can see it in Dickinson. You can see it in Bowdoin. You can see it in a variety of people. Um, you can see it in John Adams. Um, John Adams, he runs for president. John Adams had never owned a slave. Yet he says some really questionable things about slave, enslaved people. And then when he runs for president, he picks running with him, the Federalist Party, where there is more anti-slavery sentiment in the Federalist Party than there is in the Jefferson's Party. He picks as his running mate the largest slave holders in the entire union. For the first time, it's Thomas Pinckney. For the second time, it's Charles Coatsworthy Pinckney. And, but the, the, Jefferson's party, you call it the Republican Party, Democratic Republican Party, whatever name you want to give to it, they do just the opposite. They pick, as their running mate, people who are opposed to slavery, like Aaron Burr and later um, uh, uh, um, uh, Elderberry Gary. Um, they pick anti-slavery people. They're balancing their party, so they're trying to figure how far do we have to go? And so you get politicians who are wavering with their state and with the majority. And so don't you see, I mean, you can say that with the gun right issue, the gun control issue, you can see that with the abortion issue today. You get people who really care about these issues on moral grounds and they're voting on these issues. And you can, some politicians are equally sincere. I'm not condemning all politicians, but a lot of politicians are sort of blowing with the wind and see where does this fall in our area? Because mm -hmm. when you look back and I try to follow these people and I try to pretty best I can tell as a historian, put them where they come and put them where mm -hmm. they fall. And you can see that game playing. And I'm, it's interesting that you who are so politically savvy and are a lawyer could, could pick that up. Thank you. Well, that was a great answer, and we only have a couple minutes left, but I want to get to a couple of questions from the audience. So, so um, the first question, and, Adam, and maybe before we go into that, I, I recommend there's there's lots more details, historical details in the book. I mean, it, it's a really um, a good read and full of those details if you really want to understand what happened, um, and maybe try to apply some of the learning to what we do today. Uh, that's what I like about history, if we can actually learn from it, um, instead of just use it for polemics. So uh, we have a question, um, which it's tough. But well, I'll, I'll, I'll let you deal with it. Um, what do you say to someone who is family history includes the fact that their uh, relatives were enslaved about these details, these historical details? How does it help them to know what, what the real background was, what the real history was? It's a wonderful question. It's a wonderful question. As you say, it's a very difficult uh, question. I am, I'm trying to be a historian here and I'm trying not to be 
judgmental. And I'm certainly not trying to bring today the judgments of today back into the past. But yet, this history, history matters. And history affects today. What was in the past, that's why the book is called American Inheritance. We have an inheritance of liberty in America in the sense that in some ways, America, the United States was a country founded on the notions of liberty, where other countries were founded on ethnicity or or religion or geographical identity, like an island country like Japan. We were founded on notions of liberty, and you can see that. But we were founded on liberty at a time when every state initially allowed chattel slavery. That is a form of slavery that was inherited, um, inheritable. And during that liberating process, half the states, ultimately half the states abolished slavery um, in light of that liberty movement, but half the states didn't. And they then drafted a constitution that was a compromise that could cover both. And those factors, and they allowed the continuing importation of, of enslaved people into the three Southern states. And that led to a huge increase in the number of enslaved people in America. And um, blacks in America could not vote by the time of the Civil War. They could only vote, even, even free blacks couldn't vote except in a couple states. And that legacy has continuing effects. And that's not for me to judge. That's for you, the people living today, to figure out how we want to deal with this. And um, so a person who has this background, I think it helps. I think it helps to know the past of how we got to where we are. And then we can figure how we live in light of the past. We, we, we shouldn't live solely by myths and fables. And some of it can be incredibly um, eye-opening. And that's what I think a job of a historian is. So I'm not trying to judge these people. I'm trying to let the reader know what was in the past and therefore try to deal with the consequences. And I'm not trying to cop out by saying that. Uh, mm. And I don't like this issue used when they change the facts for polemics. I want people to agree on the facts and then figure what we where we go from here. All right, one one comment, and then there's one last question. Um, the comment is uh, one of the statistics that that I just remembered in your book um, that I found fascinating was that the slave trade. I think prior to the revolution, I don't know what the numbers were prior to 1800, maybe um, was that 12 million African Americans were brought to the Americas, but out of that, only only a half uh, a million or something like that came to the Northern to, to, to what is now part of America, that the other 11 and a half million went to South America and the, and, and the Caribbean and so on. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, that, that might be another book, how, how all those countries de dealt so differently with the whole slavery issue, but that's beyond it. But I, I think we always think of slavery as an American issue, whereas we're, we're really only a five or 10% of the issue of, of what happened at that time. Um, that's my comment. And the question is, um, uh, you're known as a biographer of George Washington. Um, and uh, uh, they read about this uh, story about George Washington in your thing that he, 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 he tried, as you mentioned earlier, to get slaves back. Um, and he, he sort of acted in a way uh, surreptitiously at times as if he really uh, – wasn't proud of what he was doing. Do you, know, you have anything to comment about the overall view on George Washington? Um, well, first, let me say, I'm not trying, I'm not one to judge, make a final judgment on George Washington. George Washington, overall, if you take him on balance, he brought um, more liberty to more people than I ever have, ever could, or ever will. But he also did enslave more people than I ever can, ever would, or ever. <laughs> so how do I judge him? But mm. you do What's have- What's his batting average? Uh, um, 
I can't. <laughs> uh, his batting average. Um, on, on liberty versus slavery. Is, <laughs> you know, he, and this was picked up by John Meacham in the review he did of my book in, mm. in um, the New York Times. John Meacham read the book and he said, one thing he discovered was these people knew it was wrong. And he was referring to people like George Washington. Um, well, George Washington, a couple episodes sort of show this. Um, one was when Oni Judge, his wife's um, enslaved ma hand maid uh, servant, um, closest maid servant who took care of her um, and slept in the room next door. Um, when she fled, he while well, he was president of the United States, he did not use, he tried to get her back, but he did not use the, the Fugitive Slave Act. He had signed the Fugitive, he had supported the Fugitive Slave Clause. He had signed the Fugitive Slave Act into law. He knew exactly how it worked, but it required you to be public. It required you to use judges, file courts. He, he figured out where she got to because of reports that she, because she was pretty well known. And she was discovered that she had fled Philadelphia, the capital, and went by ship and was living in New Hampshire. But he didn't, because it would be public. Instead, he quietly engaged government employees, the customs official, ask him up there, privately, don't tell anyone, but get her back, capture her. And he tried to get the governor, uh, Langdon, up there. And the governor was his supporter. He was a Federalist. He was a Washingtonian. He had supported Washington. He'd been at the Constitutional Convention, but he turned against slavery. He just said, I won't do it. I will mm -hmm. not force her back. And the customs official says, we won't force her back. We'll ask her, will you go back? We'll even carry your messages. She won't be ill-treated. She says, no way. I'm not going back there. And to the end mm -hmm. of her life in the, in the 1840s, um, she was interviewed several times. And she said, I may be poor, I may be living hand to mouth, but I'm free. Thank the Lord. The Lord made me free and I am free. And that, and these people in New Hampshire, they wouldn't, if he, he could have used the court and gotten her back. He didn't. He didn't. He wanted to keep it private. Similarly, um, he discovered early in his term that because the capital, once the capital moved from New York, where slavery was allowed initially, um, when it moved to Philadelphia, you couldn't, uh, slavery was no longer allowed. And mm -hmm. so if you're a visitor there, if you're not a local, after six, you can't stay there longer than six months and keep your enslaved property. They become free. And when he, when he's told that by the attorney general, he starts privately rotating his enslaved workers because he'd taken up valets and cooks mm -hmm. and all sorts of different people, dozens of them. He would rotate them back to Mount Vernon, um, but he did so privately. And he even wrote, we have it in a letter that he wrote to his, his chief aide, uh, uh, Tobias Lear. He said, we've got to move these back, but don't tell anyone. Don't tell mm -hmm. anyone but Martha. Don't let anyone else know. And uh, because, obviously because it wouldn't play well and he was a politician. So you have George Washington doing those things. And then of course, he had uh, Laf Lafayette, his closest, dearest aide, um, who was almost like a son to him, pleaded with him to free his slaves, enslaved people. So did Hamilton. So did uh, 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 Lawrence, another one of his aides. Hamilton was one of his aides. He doesn't do it. But then he does do it on his deathbed. Now, unlike Jefferson, who had children and debts, Washington had no debts and no children. Um, that may have freed his hands up. But he mm -hmm. hadn't even told Martha. Martha was shocked. When they opened the will and it said all of his enslaved uh, 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 people were going to be free when she died. She was so terrorized, she began sleeping in the attic with a bed on top of the door. <laughs> she was afraid they'd come in and kill her just to be, gain their, their freedom. So um, <laughs> Washington is a complex study. And mm -hmm. I, um, I am in, uh, I'm, uh, a dog might as well opine on the goodness of God as me to George Washington. Well, he did step down after two terms and that also helped 
the the whole American experiment work in the long run. Uh, so I have to give him that. Uh, when, when you were talking about the Winnie Judge story, I thought, I wonder if uh, New Hampshire uses the land, the land of the free on their license plate because of Una Judge. Well, they actually use it because they fled uh, the, the religious tyranny of New Hampshire. Yeah. But it does fit in <laughs> with that. And, and New Hampshire becomes one of the first states, um, along with Massachusetts, uh, Vermont and um, uh, Pennsylvania, to abolish slavery. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Ed. That was just great. And your book uh, is certainly a great addition to the to the uh, time and this big issue that people are talking about a lot, but, but um, you know, not always in a fair and balanced manner. Well, thank <laughs> you so much for having me on. I'm a, as you know, I'm a huge fan of the Commonwealth Club and of you. Thanks, Ed. And so there ends another of our over 1,000 programs uh, that we've done since the pandemic uh, has uh, started and getting in our way, um, but it didn't completely get in our way. So thanks for watching, and we hope you uh, watch again sometime soon. Bye.